In this video, we'll talk about respiratory pharmacology. To be clear, this is the list of different pharmacotherapies that we will talk about. As you might notice, this list does not include asthma slash COPD medications. So basically, this video is all of respiratory pharmacology minus the asthma and COPD meds. That could be its own very long video. So at some point in the future, I'll make that video. But for now, let's work through this list one at a time, beginning with antihistamines. So a little bit of pathophysiology to help explain why we use antihistamines for allergies and related respiratory conditions. When you have histamine, usually histamine binds to the H1 receptor. And to be clear, when we say antihistamines in this video, I'm referring to the H1 receptor. There are other types of histamine receptors, like H2 receptors, but those are located elsewhere and they don't mediate the same types of effects. But under normal physiologic conditions, histamine binds to the H1 receptor and three main effects are seen. One, capillary dilation causes hypotension and vascular edema. Two, bronchiolar contraction causes bronchoconstriction and shortness of breath. And three, the peripheral nociceptors or pain receptors are activated, which causes pruritus or itching and pain. So these are what happen normally when histamine binds to H1. The reason we use antihistamines is because we want to prevent this. So if we prevent capillary dilation, prevent bronchiolar contraction, and prevent the activation of nociceptors, the net effect is to decrease vascular permeability, increase bronchodilation, and of course decrease itching and pain. And that's why antihistamines are used in allergy and respiratory conditions. Now, to be clear, when I'm talking about antihistamines, there are two generations of them, first generation and second generation. The highest yield takeaway from antihistamines in terms of first versus second generation is that first generations cross the blood-brain barrier and second gens do not. What this means is because the first generation antihistamines cross the blood-brain barrier, they can have central effects. So they induce sleep, they cause you to feel sedated, and they help with motion sickness, nausea, and vomiting. The sleep effect and the effect on motion sickness, nausea, and vomiting is explained by the first generation antihistamine's ability to cross the blood-brain barrier and have those central effects. So your examples here are diphenhydramine, meclizine, and doxylamine. Adverse effects for the first generations are sedation, obviously they make you sleepy, weight gain, and then it has some anti-muscarinic and anti-alpha adrenergic properties. Now, if we compare that to second generations, your second generations do not cross the blood-brain barrier, so there are no central effects. That is to say, the second generation antihistamines are less likely to cause sleepiness and sedation, and they don't really help as much with motion sickness, nausea, and vomiting, again, because they can't penetrate into the brain. The examples here are loratadine and cetirizine. And because these have peripherally acting antihistamine effects, these are more targeted for allergy symptoms. So true allergies are better treated by second generation antihistamines. Needing to sleep or having trouble with nausea, vomiting, and motion sickness, that's better treated with first gen, all because of the blood brain barrier. Now, most people, I think, are comfortable with antihistamines because even before going to medical school, PA school, etc., you've probably seen these over the counter. But just in case you need a little mnemonic here, antihistamines, I think anti-H, which sounds like anti-itch. And this helps you remember that your antihistamines are used in allergy type conditions. So those are antihistamines. One of the lower yield medications that I'll just mention briefly is guaifenesin. Guaifenesin is an expectorant, so it thins the mucus secretions, and you use it in situations where there's too much mucus, so pretty straightforward here. Really nothing to know. The one adverse effect you might want to keep in the back of your mind is nephrolithiasis, so guaifenesin is associated with that, but overall, this is a lower yield um, medication and, and not necessarily something you should commit to memory. N-acetylcysteine, that's our next medication. This obviously is, is better known for its use in acetaminophen overdose, but you should know the mechanism here because it can be used in COPD and cystic fibrosis. N-acetylcysteine 
disrupts disulfide bonds to liquefy mucus. So just know that, and that's why N-acetylcysteine is often uh, discussed in the respiratory section when it comes to studying. Now let's talk about dextromethorphan. So the mechanism of dextromethorphan is an NMDA receptor antagonist, and this suppresses the cough reflex specifically at the nucleus tractus solitarius. So I would know the mechanism and know that structure of the brain. Clinically, dextromethorphan is used in cough, and it also has some uses in non-respiratory conditions, and those are pseudobulbar affect and major depressive disorder. Adverse effects include constipation, dizziness, and nausea, and for whatever reason, the test writers love to test serotonin syndrome. Dextromethorphan has some serotonergic activity, and because of that, the test writers love to give you a patient who had a cough, took dextromethorphan, and all of a sudden, here are the symptoms they develop, and those symptoms will be consistent with serotonin syndrome. So know the mechanism and know that it can cause serotonin syndrome, especially in combination with other serotonergic medications. So that's dextromethorphan. Really just mechanism and ser serotonin syndrome is what you should know. Alpha adrenergic agonists, these are our next category. The examples here include pseudoephedrine and phenylephrine. The mechanism, as the name implies, is that these are alpha adrenergic agonists. So they cause the release or the availability of norepinephrine, which reduces the hyperemia in the nasal tissues by vasoconstriction. So these are used as nasal decongestants. By vasoconstricting, they reduce the hyperemia in the various nasal tissues and make you feel better when you have something like sinusitis, etc. Adverse effects are what you would expect if you know basic pharmacology. So because this is an alpha adrenergic agonist, we can see high blood pressure and other stimulatory type effects centrally. So those are your alpha adrenergic agonists. Now let's talk about pulmonary hypertension agents. And if I was going to pick one category of medications to know from this video in terms of how high yield everything is, this is what I would say to memorize. So pulmonary hypertension agents, we're actually gonna talk about three different subcategories. Endothelin-1 antagonists, PDE5 inhibitors, and prostacyclins. These are three different subcategories that all collectively are used in pulmonary hypertension. So let's start with endothelin-1 antagonists. So the example of the medication that you would see is Bosentan. The mechanism is competitive inhibition of endothelin-1 receptors. And by doing that, you reduce pulmonary vascular resistance, which improves pulmonary hypertension. And pulmonary hypertension, of course, is your clinical use here. Main adverse effect to know is hepatotoxicity. Now, within the category of pulmonary hypertension, most people aren't very comfortable with the mechanisms of how these things work. So let's do a little bit of pathophysiology to help your brain remember this. So endothelin-1, those receptors, really there's two different subtypes of endothelin. There's endothelin A and endothelin B. Endothelin A is located in the pulmonary vasculature and endothelin B is located in the endothelium. Now, normally when the ligand binds to the receptor, endothelin A causes vasoconstriction and endothelin B causes bronchoconstriction. And so if we introduce something like an endothelin-1 antagonist, we're preventing this from happening. So we prevent vasoconstriction, we prevent bronchoconstriction. So the net effects here are relative vasodilation and relative bronchodilation. So that's how Bosentan, an endothelin-1 antagonist, works. Now, the way that you can remember this, if you see the name Bosentan on your exam, is that the, bo the EN in Bosentan, Bosentan, is an endothelin-1 antagonist. So just remember that mechanism. It's really important. Bosentan is an endothelin-1 antagonist. So that's our first category of pulmonary hypertension agents. Now let's talk about PDE5 inhibitors. And so the example here is sildenafil. The mechanism, as the category name implies, is that it inhibits 
phosphodiesterase 5. What happens here is that CGMP is increased, which leads to vasodilation. So clinically, this is used in pulmonary hypertension, but sildenafil is also used in erectile dysfunction. Again, this is all about vasodilation. Adverse effects, priapism, because it's used in erectile dysfunction. Because it's a vasodilator, hypotension, as well as epistaxis, and then unexplained hearing loss. That's kind of unique, so I would know that hearing loss with PDE5 inhibitors. Again, let's talk about pathophysiology because I think it makes it easier to memorize and, and much clearer to understand. So normally, CGMP, when it's active, goes through a cascade where it activates protein kinase G, there's phosphorylation involved, decreasing levels of calcium, net effect is smooth muscle relaxation, and vasodilation. But what happens is, in the presence of the PDE5 enzyme, that active CGMP gets converted to an inactive form known as 5-GMP. And so when PDE5 is active, CGMP gets inactivated, and so that smooth muscle relaxation never occurs. And instead of going under vasodilatory effects, you get relative vasoconstriction. So the way that these medications work, obviously, is by introducing a PDE5 inhibitor, you knock out the enzyme that inactivates CGMP, and CGMP is therefore active and able to move through that cascade of events, causing smooth muscle relaxation and vasodilation. So that's how PDE5 inhibitors work. Again, understand the mechanism, and probably you want to know about hearing loss as an adverse effect. Those are your PDE5 inhibitors. Prostacyclins are our last category of pulmonary hypertension agents. Honestly, lower yield compared to endothelin-1 blockers and PDE5 inhibitors. Just know the examples are epoprostanol and eloprost. These all have prost, P-R-O-S-T, in the name. So you'll remember that they're prost acyclins. Mechanism here, these are just direct vasodilators. They also inhibit platelet aggregation. Just like the other two groups that we talked about, you use these in pulmonary hypertension and the adverse effects, one, jaw pain, kind of unique, so you wanna know that, and two, because this is a direct vasodilator, you see flushing, okay? So I would know jaw pain, but otherwise prostacyclins, kind of lower yield compared to the other two categories that you see on this slide. Last agent to talk about is methacholine. And really the reason that you need to know methacholine is because it's used in the methacholine challenge test to determine if somebody has asthma. So the mechanism here is that it's an M3 agonist. So that's a muscarinic receptor. And by being an M3 agonist, methacholine induces bronchoconstriction. And because it causes bronchoconstriction, it's used in bronchoprovocation, which is a fancy way of saying methacholine challenge test. So basically what happens here is if you aren't sure if somebody has asthma, you can give them increasing doses of methacholine, which causes bronchoconstriction, and you measure their response to that medication. And over time, if their FEV1 reduces by 20% or more, then that is a confirmatory result, which tells you that the methacholine challenge test is positive and your patient indeed has asthma. So as far as methacholine goes, really all you need to memorize is the mechanism and what it's used for. So M3 agonist, it's a bronchoconstrictor, so it's not treating asthma, it's determining if a person has asthma because you're literally inducing a reduction in their FEV1. So that's methacholine. So again, here's our summary. These are all of the different classes of respiratory pharmacology that we talked about. Nothing here on the treatment of COPD or asthma because that's too big of a category and probably will be its own separate video.